Well, good evening. Good evening. Let's take our seats. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Question says, was it said greater works when it said, when it was said, greater works will you do? <clears throat> Did that mean greater works as an individual, or greater works as a group? He that believeth on me, individual. He that believeth Amen. will do the same and greater. Not they, he. So individual, all right? There you go. <clears throat> Believe, Because what happens is if you think it's a group, everybody expects somebody else to use their faith. And then nobody's faith gets used. And then nothing happens. And then they say it's God's fault. So, but if everybody's using their faith, it works. <clears throat> now, yes, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. And we've talked about that. So we are good. Grab your manuals. We're going to go to... Section 10. Section 10. <clears throat> now, you may think we've skipped these other chapters, but if you look at them, we've already talked about them. I just didn't read them to you. Now, you can go back and read the actual scriptures that talk about it, because it talks about having faith, whose faith, that kind of thing, uh, being like Jesus. You'll see all that in there. So, that's there. <clears throat> now, Section 10. <clears throat> I'm, yes, page 89, correct. We are looking at a total healing for the total person. There was a total fall, so there had to be a total redemption. <clears throat> Man's fall was complete. It was the fall of his, his spirit, his soul, and his body. And the redemption had to be complete. Now, I'll give you the quick end state, okay? And we've already talked about this again. So I'm just showing you, I haven't read the book to you straight, you know, the manual. But you've heard what's in it. And the thing is, see, I don't, I don't have to read the manual to you to get it to you. I wrote the manual. It's in here. It will come out. Okay? It just doesn't always come out in the same order that it's written because different people have different questions at different times and they need certain things answered at a certain time so that they can hear the rest of it so the Holy Spirit knows when to bring out what for each person that is there so that they will be able to get it, all right? So, now, <clears throat> as we said, man's redemption started in the Garden of Gethsemane whenever Jesus sweat blood, uh, drops of blood, as we'd say, and that was him. And if you remember in Isaiah 53, it says, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That was part, that was the part where the chastisement of our peace was on him. It was in our soul is what was going on. Now, so he bled from the head in the garden. That was for the salvation. His blood was shed for the salvation of our soul. He bled at the whipping post. And by there, it was by his stripes that we are healed physically. Then he bled on the cross, which bought our salvation of our spirit. So we have a threefold, we had a threefold fall, we have a threefold redemption, right? Now, <clears throat> there are certain things, and that's what I've been trying to do more in this seminar this time, more than I have in most of them. I'm trying to give you some certain principles and ways to look at it and approach it so that you have the principle down. There are going to be a lot of things that when you leave here, <clears throat> you're not going to know everything, all right? In other words, I can't, I, I'm, especially in roughly two and a half days, I can't give you everything I know about healing. You know, we'd have to stay here quite a bit longer for that. But I can give you the principles. And if you understand the principles and can apply them, then the other answers you need will come as you apply the principles. Amen? Now, <clears throat> so the, the primary principle, number one, is God's word is the final authority. That's the primary principle, because if you don't have that, you got nothing, right? Everything else will be hoping, you know, that kind of thing. There was nothing for you to base your faith on. You cannot have faith in God more than you know his will. <clears throat> and you, have, you know his will by how much you know his word in context. So a lot of people know scripture, but they don't know his word. They don't see it together. Now, I gave you an overview last night. And that was a position of dominion. If you get that and you have God's word locked in, then you can operate from that and everything else will start to come into play. <clears throat> Another thing 
there is this, um, and it's, it's amazing to me that God was able to bring certain things to me. I look back and I think, wow, that was the hand of God setting me up so that I would be able to learn something. As I've mentioned several times, I was raised in a household where my father was a policeman. And because of that, <clears throat> a lot of our discussions, especially as I was a teenager and growing up, was along the lines of law and things like that. I had planned on <clears throat> when, and was following in my dad's footsteps. He had been in the Air Force. Uh, I was in the Air Force. He was, and <clears throat> I went in, and then he became a policeman uh, in the civilian world. And so when I went in the military, I went in as a security police, law enforcement specialist. I was a patrol dog uh, handler and trainer <clears throat> while I was there. Then I ended up going into pararescue. Uh, but I, early on, I had planned on going into the Air Force and being a what they would call a flight surgeon. But as I grew, I moved more toward law enforcement. <clears throat> then whenever I got out, right when I married, <clears throat> I went into becoming a corrections officer for the state of Texas. So I went in, went through training, went down to the Walls Unit in Huntsville, and was there as a corrections officer. So my life had been surrounded by law and by church on my mother's side. <clears throat> and so we have a history of church even way back in our on my mother's side of our family. So in that, when I would talk to my dad, <clears throat> I would ask him questions about some of these things as we get together. And then whenever I started in ministry, it was like a lot of these things God started bringing back. And I thought, how, you know, how would that apply, actually? And so I started looking at some of these things. I, I, and I would ask my dad because, it, see, in church we would hear about, well, you know, if God knows that you're going to, I've heard people say this, well, you know, uh, my leg is crippled. And we say, well, do you want me to pray for you? No, no, just it, it's like this. God wants it this way because he knows, you know, I used to love to dance. And, and if he healed my leg, I might backslide and fall away from him and go back to dancing. I'm like, and, and see, that never sat right with me. I understand it makes some kind of natural sense. But then I started thinking about it, and I said, okay, so God is doing that to you to keep you from sinning. So what about the person that has this problem? Why doesn't God make everybody where they can't sin? If he's doing that for you, why didn't he do that for everybody? And so I started realizing that, their theology didn't hold together. So, and I always figured, you know, if God is God, then he's got to be pretty smart. And if I could find holes in the theology of the people I was listening to, I figured that couldn't be God because God's theology shouldn't have any holes in it. And so I kept trying to do it. Now, from the time I was 17 years old, <clears throat> I started praying. I read the scripture in Luke and it said that he gave him wisdom against which no man could gainsay. And so I started praying that. I said, God, I want wisdom against which no man can gainsay. I want, I want to be right, not for the sake of being right. I don't want to say, ha ha, I told you so, I'm right and you're wrong. It wasn't that. It was, I was, my biggest concern was leading people astray. I never wanted to lead somebody off. And so I was very, I mean, just obsessed with making sure what I said was right for the sake of the people. <clears throat> and so I started studying this. So I started asking my dad. So I started hearing this stuff in theology about this thing, that thing. Well, you know, <clears throat> you, all, all these different things about ministry, especially healing. And so one day we was talking to my dad, and I said, so what happens? You know, you because he was telling me, and it's amazing. You know, in Romans 13, it says that... Uh, People that wield the sword are ministers of God, and that's a reference basically to law enforcement or to uh, people in the protection service, right? And so it says that they are ministers of God, and they won't wield the sword in vain, right? And so we started looking at, uh, <clears throat> at ministry in a slightly different way. So I started talking to my dad, and I said, you know, when you drive down the street, you know, most major criminals, or let's say Criminals that are, have a big, um, they've done something big, right? Not your, well, your little criminals too, but your big criminals. Most of them are caught almost by what we would call accident. They got a tail light out. They get pulled over, they find out who they are, and it's a big deal. You know, just some small thing, right? And it's almost like a, they just slipped up and they get caught. So my dad was telling me <clears throat> that he was driving 
And I said, so how do you know what's going on? I mean, you just drive around, and how do you know something bad is going on? And, and it's funny, his answer was very simple. He said, we drive, and we look. And if we see something that doesn't feel right, we check it out. Because if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. And I thought, so you just drive around and wait for a feeling. And he said, well, kind of. He said, certain things, you'll notice certain characteristics. And he said, the longer you do it, the more aware you are of certain characteristics. You know, cars parked beside a building instead of in front of the building. <clears throat> People that sit in a car too long in a place where they, there's no need to. Things like, you know, just little things like that. <clears throat> so he said, so they will drive around. <clears throat> and we started talking about this more and more. And he started talking about it and actually realizing that there were many times that there was no reason for him to check something out, but he felt what we would call a hunch. Well, that hunch is also called the Holy Spirit. And he leads and guides them, and they don't even know they're being led. But, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to help protect. So even though they are secular, quote-unquote, God is still working with them. I don't know why we don't think that God talks to secular people. He talked to Abraham before Abraham was Abraham. Right? So God is always talking. He talked to Abimelech. Right? He told Abimelech, you're a dead man. Well, he didn't have to do that. He could have just killed him. But he said, no, you took this guy's wife, and you're a dead man. And Abimelech said, oh, wait, wait, I didn't know. Right? God has talked to <clears throat> non-godly people. Okay? If he didn't, you wouldn't be here. Right? Because you were ungodly, and then you got saved. So, so for some reason, we think that God only talks to Christians and to spiritual people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody listens to him. But we have to realize that he, he's trying to reach people. And yet we think, once we become Christian, for some reason we think it's so hard to hear God. And we act like it's really hard for us to hear him. And, and, and the thing, what it really comes down to is when we get saved, we want to be so specific. And we didn't do that beforehand, and yet God was able to get across to us. So one of the main things I try to tell people is, you know, Yes, you are to run hard after God in the sense of you're following him, you're reading, you're studying, you're blessing, you're talking to him, you're praying, you're doing all the stuff. But at some point, you just have to kind of relax and go, you know what? God is God. He's with me. We're in this thing together. Healing is his deal. It wasn't my idea. It was his idea. He's more interested in it than I am. If I see somebody that I think needs healing, I can guarantee you he feels the same way, just, you know, infinitely more. Why? Because I have the same feelings he does, but since he's God and I'm not, he feels it infinitely more than I do. Right? So it's the same thing. So <clears throat> my dad said, well, we know we just drive and we see something that doesn't seem right. We'll check it out. And I said, well, what happens if you arrest somebody and they're not guilty? You know, that not that they go to the court and all that, but I'm saying you arrest them and it's, it's uh, you know, more or less what people would think would be a wrongful arrest. Right? And he said, I said, you know, if you do something like that, do you get sued? He said, no. And I said, why not? You, you arrested this person. He said, and this, was, this really changed my thinking a lot. And I started going to the Bible and looking at it because it holds true. He said, as long as <clears throat> we have what is called just cause, if we have just cause to believe, in other words, if a rational person would believe that this person was doing something wrong, then we have the right to arrest them. And if they file a civil lawsuit or a, a lawsuit against the municipality that the policeman works for, technically the policeman doesn't get sued. The department gets sued. The city gets sued or the state or whoever they work for. They get sued. Why? Because they were doing their job with good intention and they were doing their job <clears throat> carrying out what that municipality had hired them to do and given them authority to do. So even if they do something wrong in that sense, as long as they can show that they were doing it, as we would say, in good faith, if they were doing it with good intention, in other words, they, they thought they were doing the right thing. They weren't just doing something wrong, right? They weren't just picking on somebody. Then the lawsuit goes to the city and not to the policeman. And I said, so <clears throat> he said, because we have to know that the city is going to back us up or we would be afraid to do our job because anything we do could ruin us one, one wrong time. And so I started looking at it and I thought, wow, <clears throat> all of our governmental system to some degree is based 
and I'm talking about the natural civil government system, is based on Mosaic law. And it goes back to that, which is biblical law, and it's the way God did things to natural, for natural man and to natural man. And so, but I realize, even though God was having to deal with natural man, he wasn't violating his own conscience to do it. So the law, even though the law is, you don't get saved with the law. But do you realize that if, if you could perfectly obey the law, you would be righteous, if you could. Now, because you, have a, because you were born initially with a fallen nature, you couldn't really follow the law, right? You would make mistakes. You were prone, predisposed to violating the law. So because of that, he had to put a penalty. That penalty is called the curse. Now, that law was made with Jesus. and It actually was made, Abraham filled in for Jesus, represented Jesus, and that covenant, that law, was made between God and Abraham. Then, now I say law, I'm using the word law in place of covenant in this sense, but that covenant was made there, and then because of man's predisposition to failure, God had to put the, the penalty, we call the curse, <clears throat> but the covenant was really made between God and Jesus. Abraham just filled in for Jesus because he wasn't there then, but he was, it was like he was there because he came from Abraham, so it was as if he was there, right? So pretty simple. Then Jesus came along, perfectly fulfilled the law, then took the punishment for fallen man, did it all in one fell swoop, and wrapped it all up and ended it at the cross, at the tomb, and in the resurrection. <clears throat> because of that, he took the curse, because he took that curse for us, but now, we made this exchange with him, so now we are in the position he was in because he took on the position we were in. So when we're now we're in him, we're no longer in Adam. So now, in Christ, we get the benefits of Christ, which those benefits are no curse. So we get treated as if we had perfectly fulfilled the law. So there would be no curse on us. Now, if you look at the curse, the curse is in Deuteronomy 28. Now, you know this, you've heard this before. And if you look, verses 1 through 14 are really the blessings, 15 on, the curses. You will not find any sickness or disease under the blessing category. You will only find it under, under the curse category. <clears throat> That's why it's called dis-ease, dis-ease. You're not at ease, dis-ease, right? So what we have to realize is that this fall required a complete redemption. Now... Here we are, page 89. And I'm just going to show you a couple of things. We're going to move through it fairly quick. <clears throat> but this is the probably the third or fourth most important important point. You know what I mean by that, right? In other words, like the third or fourth time I've said this is the most important point. It's not the third or fourth important in importance. It's the third or fourth time I've said it's the most important. All right? So now, <clears throat> because this is vital. See, here's the thing. There have been some great men of God that have been used greatly of God in the area of healing. Even in modern times, you've even had people like John Wimber that was amazingly used by God to help get healing outside of the church and, and get it uh, out in the public, you might say. And, but the thing is, <clears throat> one of the things is that um, most of these people that were very effective in healing Almost every one of them died from the very thing they had the most success at beating. Almost every one of them. Even when John Lake passed away, he passed away at the age of 65, which is still too young. And he passed away of what people said was a stroke. Okay, <clears throat> He had this stroke. Um, it was on uh, Memorial, Memorial Day. Yeah. And, no, I'm sorry, it was Labor Day. Labor Day weekend. And um, he'd gone home. They had a, a Sunday picnic at his church. Uh, after the picnic, he went home. He was going to go back that evening and preach. He was feeling tired. His wife, Florence, was there. She said, you stay home and rest. I'll take the service tonight. So she went and performed the service. And then when she got back home, he had had a stroke while she was gone. And for about two weeks, he kind of went back and forth. He kind of rallied a bit and got bad and then got better and got worse and kind of back and forth. And some people prayed for him. And they kind of came around, which that was my big question, is where was all these people that he trained? But see, that's one of the other things that I noticed. People think that if you're the guy, you don't need any help. You never need any help. And so they thought, what this, and that's when I asked them the questions, that was some of the things they said. Well, this was John Lake. 
We thought he had this. We thought he would bounce back. You know, we'd seen other things happen. We thought he'd bounce back. But the problem was with the body needs the body. And there's times when we all need help. There's times when we all need strengthening. There's times we all need to walk together because that's the purpose of the body being together, right? So <clears throat> then he went on for about two weeks and then finally passed away on September 16th, 1935. <clears throat> now, this stroke, he had had great victories in a lot of areas. And one of the things that we started noticing in all these different guys, like going back to John Wimber, like I said, John Wimber was, he, he has some really good stuff. He did the book called uh, Power Evangelism, uh, different things. I've actually ministered and trained the uh, people at the Vineyard, which was his uh, group. Uh, Brian Blount, which is the head of, was the head of the uh, uh, Divine Healing Teaching Department, you might say, for the Vineyard. I trained him. We, he came to a conference. We talked. We met, went through these things, and he took it back and started going to the Vineyard. And as we talked, he said, you know, one of the things about John John Wimber, was that he never locked down whether healing was in the atonement or not. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you talk to him one week, healing's in the atonement. It's right there, I can see it. You talk to him next week, I'm not sure. Maybe that's talking spiritual or not physical. So he never locked it down. And if you don't lock down that physical healing for your physical body, is in the atonement, in the redemption of Jesus Christ, there will always be a question mark. There will always be an if. And you can never pray in faith because faith has no if. Right? And so he was always kind of bouncing around between these two positions. <clears throat> and anytime you bounce between two positions, that's called wavering. Now, I'm not putting him down. He was a great man of God. It's just he didn't see it. <clears throat> and you can see several other people. Right, they had kind of the, not the same position as that. One of the things you'll notice is that most of the people, almost to a man, I mean to, to a person, the people that were great, that have been the most strongly used by God in healing, all believe this one thing. Healing, physical, bodily healing, is in the atonement of Jesus. And they always go back to a couple of scriptures. Now, I'm going to give you some, but there's a lot more, but I'm going to give you a couple here that we're going to look at that prove this, right? Now, of course, the number one one is Isaiah 53. That's one most people go to first off. But we're going to take you to that. But first, we're going to start right here. <clears throat> Page 89, <clears throat> total healing for the total person, healing in redemption. God made man a physical, spiritual being. Redemption must be a physical, spiritual redemption. If what God did did not undo what Satan did, and completely overshadow it, then what Satan did was greater than what God did. And the minute you say, because Satan's work caused the fall of man, which allowed death to enter, and death, because death, the, the essence of death, the principle of death, is now in the world, because of that, sickness and disease started. So sickness and disease is nothing more than baby death. In other words, it's death in baby form. If, if, you, let, if you don't have a, an immune system, any sickness or disease can grow up and kill you. So it's all death, right? It's all under the category of death. Now, <clears throat> because of that, okay, sin and sickness are two fruit from the same tree. Sin and sickness are always grouped together, always. In Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Underline all, right? Now, remember, I don't have my pen here somewhere. Anyway, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> he says, don't forget all of his benefits. Now, if we were going to write that today, we would say, don't forget any, right? But he says, forget not all. That's just King James. So don't forget any. Now, do you know that there are entire denominations that have built their entire theology on purposely forgetting some of God's benefits, right? And they've, they've done that because they have decided of what they called cessationism that power stopped after the first century, okay, or during the first century. Now, <clears throat> notice verse 3, who forgives all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases, right? Now, I'm going to say some things here that if you're not 
um, solid in your salvation, if you're not solid in the believing the Word of God and knowing that you are connected to Him, you might get concerned, right? But I'm saying this because I'm trying to draw an emphasis, and what I'm saying is true. But don't get scared. It gets better, at least toward the end, okay? <laughs> yeah. So, who forgives all thy iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. Is that what it says? Yes. So, all is all. Is that right? Yes. Now, if you don't believe that God healed all of your diseases, how can you be sure he forgave all your iniquities? They're both in the same sentence. Do you say? You see what I'm saying? So you can't just say, well, I believe this one, but I don't believe that one. No, it's in the same sentence, same verse. So if he did all for one, he had to do all for both. Now, that, the emphasis here is this. Most people try to make healing an add-on. Get saved, spend eternity with God. This is what counts. This is the only thing that counts. Get saved. Oh, and by the way, healing, yeah, that's okay. But if you don't get it, at least you die. And if you die of sickness, at least you go be with God. Okay, what if you treated salvation that way? You see? Well, let me tell you, if you say that, you are treating salvation that way. Why? Because healing is part of the definition of the word salvation. So if you say salvation, you're going to have to be more specific because we, when you say salvation, it means healing, wholeness, preservation, uh, provision. It means security. It means all of these things, right? So you can't, if you're going to say salvation, you have to specify. Are you talking about the salvation meaning uh, saved from sin? Or are you talking about salvation meaning saved from sickness? Because they're both part of the same thing. And so if you're going to talk about it, what are we going to talk about? If you're going to talk about salvation in general, that's everything. So we can talk about all of it, right? And, of course, Jesus literally means, uh, especially Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, Jehovah is Savior, right? And that word Jehovah is a Jehovahistic name, which is a covenant name which God gave us. And we have to remember, and now there were at least 16 different Jehovah names, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh, I mean, just all the way through. Isn't that right? All these different names, at least 16. Some people would even say more. So if you look at these Jehovahistic names, they were all covenant names to where God said, this is who I want you to know me as. This is who I want to be to you. So <clears throat> we would say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who is our provider. That means that he wants us to know him as our provider. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. He wants us to know him as the one that heals us. So these Jehovah names are to show us aspects of his nature. Now, Dr. Summerall used to say that faith is like a, a diamond with 56 different facets. And each, you can look at each, you can look at the diamond through each one of these different facets. Well, these Jehovahistic names are different facets of God's nature. But you can't just remove one and think it doesn't change everything because there's no one that gives you the right to change God's name, like we've already said. So this Jehovah name, <clears throat> you go through it. Now, he says here, watch this. So if he forgives all your iniquities, then he also for heals all your diseases. If he doesn't heal all your diseases, there's no guarantee that he has forgiven all your iniquities. Is that right? That's what he said right there. Now, you, you really just can't pick and choose. You've got to decide it's either all or nothing. Okay? It's not either or. It's all or nothing. Now, verse 4. Who redeems your life from destruction. Now, just, just saying that, who redeems your life from destruction, is that physical healing or is that spiritual? Because, see, you can't tell just by what it says. That... And that's the way God wants it. Why? Because, see, here's what, here's what people do. Or here's, well, let me say it this way. Here's what the devil will do. He will tell people, okay, look, if it comes down to it, I mean, really, salvation from sin, getting born again, eternal life, that's what counts. Okay, not a whole lot of argument with that. But why do you think we need to separate that? Because that's what he always says. Well, you know, if you come down to it, I mean, Salvation is more important than healing. Well, now, that's a redundant statement because salvation is healing. You just said healing is more important than healing if you use all the definition of salvation, right? But the funny thing is people say, well, yeah, but come on, let's get down to it. So, you know, if you had to choose between salvation, eternal life is what they mean, or healing, 
which would be more important? Obviously, the eternal life. That's their whole idea. Okay, here's my question. Who said you have to choose? See, why do we even go there? It's like people say, well, you know, without Jesus, we can do nothing. Okay, are you without him? Well, well, no, I'm born again. Okay, then why would you bring it up? Why would you even bring up being without him, right? You, you, you say you're saved. Then he said he will never leave you or forsake you. So then I can only assume that you must have left him because he said he's never going to leave you. So why would you even be talking about what you can't do without him, right? Why don't you look at the other side and say, with him, I can do all things. You see the difference? But human nature, until the mind is renewed, it will always go toward the negative. Always. That's what it does. That's why you have to have your mind renewed, and not just your mind, but you have to, have your, you have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, the spirit of your mind is the positive or negative side of the mind. There are people that quote scripture. You realize there are people that die sick quoting scripture. You know that? I mean, they got it. They quote it. They quote it constantly. You hear that? And they die quoting Scripture. Why? Usually it's because they know Scripture, but they have not had their mind renewed, and they've not been renewed in the spirit of their mind. And let me tell you, you can quote Scripture out of fear, and it won't do you any good. So if you're going to quote Scripture, you've got to quote it out of faith that it is a real fact for you right then. Right? Now, and this is amazing because it shows how God is so much bigger than a lot of times we give him credit for. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was sent a video, and it was from China. Now, these were not Christians. These were people in the medical field, which, strangely, would be talking about China and medical field at the same time right now. But there were people in the, in the medical field in China that had a person that had they were set up on a monitor, and it showed this huge tumor in this person's body. These Chinese, not believers, just Chinese, got around this person, and they all started saying the same thing together in unison as one. And what they were saying was real simple. Already done. Already done. Already done. They were saying it in Chinese, but that's what they kept saying. And they did this for over an hour and a half. But you could watch the monitor... And what they, had cho what they had done beforehand, they said, we're going to go in and we are going to, and they were all touching this person, and they said, we're going to go in and touch this person, and then we're all going to say, already done, and what we're thinking is, this tumor is already gone. So that's what they locked in their brain, this tumor is already gone, and then they started saying, already done, not going to go, already done. And they did this for an hour and a half, and you could watch the monitor, and this tumor shrunk down until it disappeared. Not even believers. Do you get that? And yet believers have a problem speaking God's word that by his stripes you were healed, so it's already done. Do you get that? Now, I'm not saying it's mind over matter. I'm saying that the world has learned how to extricate this, the truth, and apply it without God, and it still works. How much more should it be working for us who are believers in him who is the father of health? Amen? Amen. But we put all this stuff out, and it's amazing, and so many other things. You know, if you wait around long enough, science starts to catch up with some of what the Bible says. <clears throat> and now, if you talk quantum physics, you act, you're actually talking faith for the most part. Because it, ex it explains how faith can actually work in, to a large degree. Now, he says here, watch this. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Look at verse 6. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Now, look at that. The Lord executes righteousness. In other words, he does what is right. And, watch this, he executes judgment for all that are oppressed. Not, he does not execute judgment on the oppressed. That'd be a double oppression, right? But he doesn't execute judgment on the oppressed. He executes judgment for the oppressed. Now, if you go before a judge 
and you've got your case, right? Maybe you have been uh, wrongfully accused of something, and you're the defendant, and you've got the, the, the plaintiff there, right? Uh, the prosecutor, have whatever situation you're in. And you lay out your case, and your, your lawyer lays out your case, and then those that are against you lays out their case, and then it goes to the judge's decision. And, he, and what, it said, what they usually say is, now notice he doesn't say I a lot of times. If he does it correctly, he will say this court, because it's not him, but it's the court he represents is speaking when he speaks. So he speaks, and he says this court renders judgment for the defendant or for the plaintiff, whatever, whichever side he's going for. Now, so if you're being wrongfully accused and he knows that, then he's going to render judgment for you. The judgment would be for you. Now, what that means is the case against you has been dropped and you win. Is that right? So that's what this means here. Now, notice God, who is the judge, renders judgment. He does what is right and he renders judgment for all. Notice that word all. See that? All. Same all that's up there in verse 3. The same all that deals with all your iniquities and all your diseases. That same all is the all that he, that he renders judgment for all that are oppressed. You got that? Now, when I read this for all that are oppressed, I think of Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? For God was with him. So now we know that the devil is the oppressor, and God rendered judgment for all the oppressed. Now, when you render judgment for all the oppressed, this is that class action lawsuit we were talking about, where he says, all the oppressed, you're free. That means everybody goes free. That was the oppressed. Right? In other words, everybody that was injured by that company or whatever product or whatever, they all go free. Amen? They're all recompensed, rewarded, whatever it is, for the damage is done. Amen? Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, notice, all. Right? Then, he says he renders judgment for all that are oppressed, and it said that Jesus healed all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Well, now think about this. Jesus, see, people think that Jesus went about picking who to heal. This person, that person, them. No, he healed them all. He healed all that were oppressed. If he saw anybody that was oppressed, he healed them. Do you get it? Why? Because oppression is of the devil. He healed all that were oppressed of the devil. So basically, he didn't have to say, Father, do you want me to heal this one? Father, what about that one? What about that? No, all that are oppressed, right? Now, see, that's exactly how policemen function, right? <clears throat> the policeman's job is to stop any criminal, right? Anytime, anywhere, any criminal. And matter of fact, used to, you know, well, especially when my dad was a policeman, <clears throat> a lot of times there was, you know, the policeman would be off duty, but they were never off duty. In other words, if something happens while they're off duty, they are still bound by their oath to try to stop whatever's going on, whether they're technically on duty or not. Now, if they didn't, even if they were technically off the clock, which they were never on the clock or off the clock it was all the time. <clears throat> Regardless, it would be classified as dereliction of duty, and they could actually be prosecuted if they did not try to stop something. Now, think about that. Then we started seeing the same thing in the civil area, and it's called the Good Samaritan Law, that if you see something going on, an accident or whatever it is, and you don't stop and render aid, you can actually be charged under the Good Samaritan Law that you did not stop and render aid, right? So now it's a law that we should do what's right, Okay. Now, this, so technically, as God's policeman, we are never off duty. What does that mean? That means that I'm not, quote unquote, and I'm just using the word anointed because how most people think of it, but I'm not just anointed when I'm behind the pulpit, right? <clears throat> Years ago, I was teaching Saturday, on a Saturday, all day long, taught a, an all day, one day seminar, and there was a man there with his wife that uh, they came out of the Church of Christ. As a matter of fact, they graduated from Harding University in Arkansas. They both graduated top of their class. As a matter of fact, she graduated just a little bit higher above him, but they were at the top of their class. <clears throat> they were well-versed in Church of Christ doctrine, right? <clears throat> they went through four years of college, very expensive, all this stuff. His wife was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. So they went in, took out her thyroids, 
and yet still there were still other problems. Not to mention the fact that she had to eat a certain diet and had to eat a certain way and all this kind of stuff. So <clears throat> he was looking for healing for his wife because she still had cancer. Even though they took out the, the thyroids, there was still cancer in her body. So she, uh, he, <clears throat> he's looking for healing. He lived in a town that was about 20 miles from us. So he goes online. He had never heard of John Lake, didn't know anything. He looked up Smith Wigglesworth. In that, healing came up. He typed in healing. John G. Lake came up. He started looking at John Lake. Then all of a sudden, he typed in John Lake more and did a little bit further. And all of a sudden, John G. Lake Ministries came up, and he found out we were less than 20 minutes from where they live. And so he said he called. <clears throat> and I was doing a seminar that weekend. And so he brought his wife over along with, I think, four other people that were all graduates of Harding University. So they all came over. They were sitting there during the morning. We went from 9 to noon and then 2 to 5. That was the idea. We sat till noon. I was teaching. They were sitting listening. Whenever we broke for lunch, he came to me and said, could we take you to lunch? I said, okay. Yeah, we'll do it. He said, I have some other people here with me, uh, but they're going home. Uh, they don't like this. And I said, okay. And he said, so let's go eat. And he said, you pick where we want to go. And I said, we went somewhere near there. We go inside. We sit down. <clears throat> they come and take our order. As they were filling, or they were taking our order, uh, they left, brought our drinks, and then they left again. And his, I noticed his wife opened this bag. It was a, like a purse, but it was big. And so she opens it up and pulls out this food, this sandwich that she had prepared because she had a special diet she had to eat. Well, I didn't know that, or I wouldn't have suggested going somewhere. We could have just talked. But she pulls it out, and it's a sandwich. It's a certain way, and I'm noticing. I didn't know anything about her cancer or anything else. I just noticed, okay, this is a little unusual. And so we started talking, and he said, first off, I want to tell you. He said, uh, she and I graduated at the top of our class. We've got invitations to different places, different churches, to pastor those churches, these kind of things. I'm like, okay. And... He said, but I want you to know, in three hours, this is just the first half of the seminar. He said, in three hours, actually three 45-minute sessions, he said, you completely destroyed a four-year university education. <laughs> he said, my, my parents paid a lot of money for me to go to college, and you totally destroyed my theology today. He said, I sat there and tried to pick it apart, what you were saying. He said, I can't pick it apart. He said, this, this is amazing. He said, I've never heard anything like this. And so we talked for a bit, and we went through some different things, and then he started telling me about, a little bit about his wife. He didn't really mention anything. So now <clears throat> lunch is over. we got to head back. I've got to finish teaching for another three hours. And so we go back out to the car. They're parked next to my car. We get in between. I'm fixing to get in my car. He's parked there, and he says, um, now this is Saturday. He said, tomorrow, uh, he said, my wife has cancer told me about the thyroids and all that stuff. And he said it was her parathyroids that they had already moved is what it was, <clears throat> not just her thyroid. And so he said, tomorrow, if I bring my wife to church, can you pray for her? And we're standing between our cars in the parking lot. It was, I'll tell you, it was at a Cheddar's, right? Just a regular restaurant. And he said, if I bring her, can you pray for her tomorrow? And I said, why do you want to wait till tomorrow? I said, why, why don't we just do it right now? And he said, we're right here? I said, yeah. He said, you can do that right here. I said, yeah. He said, we don't have to be in church. And I said, no. I said, the Spirit of God is with me, and whatever I can do anywhere, I can do anywhere. If I can do it there, I can do it here. And he said, well, yeah, that'd be great. And so <clears throat> she came around the side of the car, took her by the hand, commanded the cancer to die, commanded to leave her body, commanded her parathyroids to return, and for them to grow back. So we get the command, they get in the car, we go back over, teach for another three hours, three 45-minute sessions. Then they leave, and the next morning, he comes to church, but she had, she had to work. She was a nurse at the Dallas Children's Hospital. And so she was a nurse there, and so, and well, apparently, I found out later, well-respected, and she worked in the uh, neonatal uh, pediatric section, uh, section. And so... She was there, but it was really good now because they couldn't have children. And here she's working around babies, and yet she's working around babies that the majority of them are dying. And so it just really tore her up, which I totally understand. So 
she goes to work. He comes to church. Then they, he goes back home Monday. She goes, he, he, she, while he was at church, she called and left a message and said, um, I forgot my medicine at home. And he said, well, do you want me to bring it to you? She said, no, no, I'm okay. And he said, well, are you sure? You want to? She goes, yeah, yeah, I'm doing okay. So she came home. Next day, she went back to work. And she comes and said, you know, I haven't taken my medicine, but I'm feeling okay. And he said, well, why don't you, you got prayed for her Saturday. Why don't you go ask him to check you out? Because she could just go over and say, hey, check me out and get it done. And so she went and got checked out. She called back and said, um, not only is the cancer gone, but I've got parathyroids. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's, now he's excited, right? He, he actually worked for a, a, a banking, a large banking company, okay? Very well known, and he worked for them. And so, <clears throat> so he calls me and tells me all this stuff. And he said, this is amazing. He said, this is, this is wonderful. This is exactly what I was hoping would happen. And he said, um, so do you have anybody that travels with you? Because I was traveling quite a bit. And I said, eh, sometimes I do. It kind of depends. He said, do you want somebody to travel with you? And I said, well, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great to have somebody, you know, that I could depend on to be there. He said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll put in my resignation. I'm quitting. I'm traveling with you. And so he quit his job. Okay, and actually started traveling with me. <clears throat> and so when we went from there, went to Chicago, and I did a DHT. And so he sat there and took notes. And he was, a, I mean, like a stenographer. He was amazing in being able to take notes. And in three days, he made notes and gave points to or numbers to each point that I made. And over those three days, he, I made 1,545 points in three days, right? And all of these are not just little, it's not every sentence I said, but it's points. And so he wrote all these out, and it's almost like a book itself. And so he started studying this. He traveled with me for quite a bit. Then uh, after a bit, uh, he, he asked me to pray. He said, you know, uh, we've never been able to have children. Would you pray? If we prayed. Within a year, they had a boy, right? And so now you can see this, it's just God's moving in their life. And then he said, okay, I need to settle down. I need to stay home. I can't travel like I did before, so I need to stay home. And he, I said, okay, that's you know, not a problem. <clears throat> so then he, he got a job back with his company. And the funny thing was, right after, now, during this time, uh, because she worked at the hospital, we had a door into the hospital. So we started going to the hospital. We'd go buy a whole bunch of these little stuffed animals. We'd take them, lay our hands on them, pray over them, let life go into them, and then we couldn't go in and, and go up to the, to the room and ask to come in, but we could walk through the hall, and the doors are usually open. So we'd walk through and kind of wave the, the stuffed animal to the parents and kind of like, do, do you want that? And they're like, oh, yeah, come on in. If they invite us in, we can go in. So as soon as they invite us in, we'd give the toy to the child, and then we would ask, would you mind if we pray for your child? Oh, you know, almost 99% of the time, absolutely, please do. So we would do that. We would minister to him. And so we started seeing healings. Now, the thing was, his wife was learning this. And so all of a sudden, they started noticing the percentage rates of babies dying switched. More babies were living than dying. And then they started calling her and saying, hey, we've got a child over here with this, a case here. Come, would you come over here and do that thing you do? And so she would go over and she would lay hands on them. And just let life go into them and just speak life to them and the baby would get well. And they started making note of this and they started asking her all over the time, you know, to come around and pray for different babies. So we saw this going on in the hospital. So then he got his job back. Then they transferred him to California. Well, surprisingly, they transferred him to Reading. When they transferred him to Reading, he started going to Bethel. When he went to Bethel, Bill Johnson found out that he had traveled with me. So all of a sudden, now he's Bill Johnson's best buddy. And so he's hanging out with Bill Johnson. And Bill Johnson, what did Curry teach you? And so he started sharing that with Bill Johnson. Now, we had some other people that were in healing rooms there that were doing what I taught them. And they actually got kicked out of their healing rooms because they, they said they were not relying on the anointing enough. They were getting people healed, but they weren't relying on the anointing enough. Okay, That's, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that happened, and he started traveling a little bit uh, when he could with Bill Johnson. And so some of this started getting into Bethel, and, but yet a lot of it got pushed out. So uh, because, you know, we didn't emphasize, quote, unquote, the anointing enough. 
And so it just kind of shows how a, a religiosity can keep truth from coming in, right? Now, I'm saying all that to get back to this point because I want to get into healing and redemption and I'm going to have to hurry a little bit. But notice judgment for all that are oppressed. When Jesus came, take your Bible. I don't, it's not in your manual here. But if you look in your Bible or you can look on the wall <laughs> or behind me in Luke, Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, and we already know what happened in 17. The book was delivered to him. Verse 18 says, this, here he's quoting from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach or proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, that wasn't the end. That's in the middle of the verse. And then it says, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. Now, <clears throat> notice this. If you can change just the paradigm you have about Jesus and about God, about how he did things, we want, we've been taught and we've been urged to believe that it's all this wispy and hard to figure out and not knowing the, the, the hidden wisdom of God and God's got some secret will and that's why this is going on and all these things. And then add that in with the sovereignty of God, that God can do anything anytime he wants. Okay, there's several things God can do. There's at least two, right? You ask somebody, can God do anything? Yes, God can do anything. That's not true. Oh, yeah, he can do everything. No, God can't do anything. He cannot do anything. And you can't do everything, put it that way. And they'll argue with you. Oh, yeah, God can do anything. Okay, no. God himself said he cannot lie. So that's something he can't do. They go, well, yeah, I know that. Well, you didn't a minute ago. Right? So, and there's another thing he can't do. He can't make you pay your tithes. Okay, that's another whole thing we're not going to talk about right now. <laughs> but, okay. But <clears throat> notice here. The sovereignty of God does not mean that God just does whatever he wants. He is bound by his own word. He said, I will not alter the thing that's gone out of my mouth. In other words, this is the way it is forever. Oh, Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Isn't that right? So this thing, if you know this, you know what he's going to do. It's just that simple. But then you had this guy come along at one point called Augustine, and he started talking about the hidden will of God. He started talking about the sovereignty, and there's this hyper-sovereignty, which means God is fickle and can do anything he wants, anytime he wants, any way he wants, and you never know what God's going to do. And that's why we talk about in the uh, insurance policies, an act of God. You know, a tornado came through. It was an act of God. A hurricane, did, uh, an earthquake, an act of God. Well, okay, you could be right. Just which God are you talking about? Because you're talking about the God of this world. Yeah, okay. If you're talking about the God of heaven and earth, no, nah, that's different because that's not his nature, right? So, but you can know the will of God. Now, notice here, Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Isn't that right? He was also the word manifest in the flesh. So here he says, <clears throat> the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, yep, <clears throat> and to proclaim deliverance to the captives, proclaim deliverance to the captives, to proclaim, not to offer, proclaim, right? Remember I talked about this yesterday. <clears throat> and to uh, preach, yeah, proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice everything Jesus did is wrapped up in this. This was his, uh, you know, here we are in an election year and every party has their platform and their platform says, here's what we believe and here's what we stand for and don't hold us to this because we're not going to hold ourselves to it. That's, that's the last thing they say. No, it should be, all right? And no, we don't mean anything we're saying. That's one, of, that's one of our platforms. We never mean what we say. So anyway, <clears throat> now, so how did Jesus know who to heal? It was simple. He just went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So how did he know if somebody was oppressed of the devil? Uh, they were sick. See, years ago, it was funny because we were talking about some of this because I would leave, <clears throat> and every time I'd go on a trip, something would happen back home. 
And then one of these days, you know, finally they would, while I'm on the trip, they'd be calling and say, Dad, this is happening. Pray for this. Such as that, pray for that. And I'm always having to deal with things back home, even when I'm on the road. So then one day I got back home and I asked, okay, well, what happened? I hadn't heard from anybody. Oh, this happened, that happened, this other thing. I'm like, wow, okay. I said, so, so what do we need to do? Oh, don't worry. We handled it. We took care of it. And I'm like, what? You know, has salvation come to this house? Is that what happened? You, you've actually got a hold of it? And they're like, oh, yeah, we handled it. We just did what you would do, and we did this. And I'm like, great, okay, you got it, right? But now notice how they knew what to do. They knew my will. They knew what I would have done. They knew what I would want done because they knew me well enough to know what my nature, my character, what my will is. It wasn't vague to them, right? And in the past when they had to call me, it still wasn't vague. They knew what to do. They just didn't know how to get it done. But... What we have to realize is that God is not fickle. He is very predictable. And if you know his word, you know him. If you don't know his word, you really won't know him very well. And if you don't know his word, you don't know his will. And if you don't know his will, you really can't have faith any further than you know his will. So up until that time, you're always hoping. And like I said, that was one of the problems with John Wimber was he didn't have the, the uh, redemption, <clears throat> you know, the atonement, healing in the atonement down. And he would vacillate between from one to the other and because of that, uh, when he died, he actually died of a, of a heart problem. And yet he had great success in dealing with people with heart problems. And it's, what it is is the enemy, and what you have the most success at, you make them mad. And if you get tired or you get tired of fighting, then the enemy will come back in and try to take you out with the thing you had. Why? It's just retaliation. He's just upset because you beat him so much, and he sees an opening, right? So you have to realize. Now, here's one of the things that we learned. And this is amazing because it goes right along with medical science today, too. If you are a type A individual, aggressive, proactive, active, right, usually you don't develop slow, debilitating diseases. You almost always die of something quick, heart attack, stroke, something massive. Why? It's geared to take you out because the enemy knows you're, an, you're a type A individual. You're a fighter. And if he doesn't take you out, you will fight, come back, and beat him. So he tries to take you out quick. Now, if you're passive, which unfortunately the church has been masterful at creating passive Christians, Right? Because they think somehow passivity, they think that weakness equals meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength held in reserve, right? And used appropriately. That's what meekness is, all right? So <clears throat> if you, but if you are a passive individual, very seldom do you really get hit with massive, quick things that'll take you out quickly. Usually, you're attacked with slow, debilitating type diseases, things that will gradually eat away your life, cause you to go down, down, down until eventually you die. It doesn't want to take you out quick. The enemy doesn't want you to die quick unless he's trying to get you out of the way because he's afraid of you, right? He's afraid you'll fight and come back. <clears throat> if, if he knows you're passive, then he will try to take you out slowly because he has no fear of you fighting back. And his job, what he wants, is he wants to be a parasite off of you and literally eat away your life slowly so that it takes longer to do so that he can torture and make you suffer longer because that's the other side of what he's trying to do. He's not just trying to, uh, you know, draw off of you. He's trying to make you suffer in the meantime. And so what we started realizing was that as we were training, we were taking people and taking them from passive to aggressive. And what we found out was when we started doing that, the, literally the diseases or the attacks that they had to face switched. Literally it switched from being you know, slow and debilitating to all of a sudden now it, things would try to hit them and take them out. So you know, the good news is um, you're, you know, if, if you get a hold of this, you'll become aggressive which simply means the enemy is going to try to take you out quickly. That may not be the good news. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, the good news is you don't have to put up with either one. Amen? You can live in victory over both of them. Amen? So 
Now, but the church has to realize that there is a warfare going on. But if the church thinks that everything that happens is God, then if something's going on, well, it's God's will. Well, then you're not going to fight against it. But yet we're told to resist. We are told that we have enemies, right? And that we wrestle against these enemies. And we keep seeing this stuff about fighting the good fight. Isn't that right? So there's all this stuff. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's all this warfare talk. We have armor that we have to put on, right? So we know there's a warfare, but most Christians act as though we don't have an enemy. And that we don't really need one because God's the one that does all the bad stuff to us anyway. And we don't realize that it's the devil doing it and we don't fight against him. So you have to know for a surety that there is an enemy that's out to kill you, kill your family. And if he can't touch you, he'll go after your family. Why? Because he knows that's the next thing to you, right? And so he will go down the list and see at what point he can get in. But now we have the promise, number one, even out of Psalms 91, out of Luke 10, 19, we have these promises that nothing shall by any means hurt you. We also have the promise that it will not come near your dwelling. I just taught last Sunday on no plague. No plague will come near your dwelling, right? So you have the authority over your dwelling, over everything you own, and you have the right to draw that line and say, no, you don't, right? <clears throat> so I could give you many stories, different things happen like that. But now notice, Jesus did not have to ask the Father who to heal. All he had to do was see the sick. His platform already said he was sent to proclaim deliverance to the captives. If he saw a captive, he knew to proclaim deliverance. If he saw a sick, if he saw a blind, he knew to open their eyes. Isn't that right? If he saw the brokenhearted, he knew to heal the brokenhearted. Why? That's part of his commission. So if it's part of your commission, you don't have to wonder about it, right? And, and it's funny because if you see a policeman, I'm always going back to this because you've got to get this thing with authority and dominion and functioning as, as, as God's policeman. If you look at a policeman, they go through the academy or they go through uh, the training they go through, and at some point, they're going to receive a certificate, and on that certificate, it's going to say commissioned as a peace officer. And I'm talking about from Texas. That's what is on there. I don't know what Louisiana has necessarily, but it's going to be something similar. But it says that they will be a commissioned peace officer. So they're committing. Say, that doesn't just say, here, we grant you the license to be a police officer. No, you're commissioned. A commission is a mission in, in cooperation with another entity. So that entity, you are now in cooperation with them to accomplish a mission, which the mission of a peace officer is to keep the peace. That's why they're called peace officers, right? <clears throat> so you have this commission, and that commission is what? It, it's, your, it's your duties. So you can look, and it'll tell you what your duties are. This book tells us, what our commission is. And matter of fact, we know what our commission is because we even call it the Great Commission. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. See, if you start to realize that all of this, this is not some haphazard thing, that God is just doing things as he wills, back, you know, back and forth. And when I say as he wills, I mean some type of fickle thing. God is doing healings as he wills. And the beauty is he always wills. Yes. See, that's the thing. Now, I remember I gave this example one time. I mean, th picture this. You got a, a Christian living in a house, and the policeman, who is a Christian, okay, uh, comes driving down the street, and he sees this burglar crawling out the window of the Christian's house. Now, if the Christian, if the policeman is a well-trained, spirit-filled Christian, then as he sees that burglar crawling out of, his, out of this window, not his window, but out of this other Christian's window, then if he's a well-taught Christian today, he's going to stop and think, wow, I wonder what so-and-so did to deserve that. that. It must be sowing and reaping because this burglar is broken into his head. I wonder, well, you know what? I bet, I wonder if he left his window unlocked because if, if he left the window unlocked, then I can't do anything to the burglar because he left the door open. Is this ringing with any theology you might have heard? See, the thing is, what people forget is that Jesus called the devil a liar, a thief, and a murderer from the beginning. Right? Now, here's the thing. And it's amazing to me because people always say, well, you know, I'm, I, I opened the door to the devil. I gave him authority. 
to come into my life. I gave him it because I left the door open. So you, now understand, there are different levels of crime, right? <clears throat> and if a person breaks into your home, then it's breaking and entering if they break in. If you leave the door standing open, it's still illegal for somebody to come in and take your goods. That's still theft. It's still burglary. It's still, uh, you know, whatever other crimes they can rack up on them, right? But so just because you leave the door open doesn't mean the enemy, the burglar, has the right to come in and take anything. But yet we say, well, I opened the door so the devil came in so, you know, he has a right to come in. No, just because the door is open doesn't mean he has a right. Now think about this. Jesus never said the devil ever had a right. He said he's a thief. What makes a thief a thief? They take stuff they don't have a right to take. Is that right? So that now understand, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, all authority, he, King James says power, Greek word is authority. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Is that what he said? All authority. Now, again, all iniquity has been forgiven. All diseases have been healed. Isn't that right? All the oppressed. Is that right? All, all these words, all, right? Now, if does all still mean all? So if, now, if Jesus has all, then that means the devil has none. Now, at the point that Jesus, now think about this, at any point that the devil has any, Jesus has become a liar because he no longer has all. So is there ever a point in which Jesus doesn't have all? So is there ever a point in which the devil ever has any? Okay, so no matter what you do, and you say, well, 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 wait, I gave him authority because I let him. Okay, wait a minute. Let's talk about that. Can you give the devil authority? Okay, first off, why do you think you need to? He's a thief. He doesn't need authority. He has ability, which is why Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power, ability of the enemy. He never even admitted that the enemy had authority. He just said the enemy has ability. If the enemy had authority, he wouldn't have been a thief. See, <clears throat> but he does have ability. See, a robber can have ability and not have authority. That makes sense? Yes. And that's what makes him a robber. He has, he has the gun, but he doesn't have the right to remove the, the money. But if he does, he's a thief, right? So he has the ability. But now he says that we have authority over the ability of the enemy. So now notice, but here's the, the even better news, really. If Jesus has all, all authority, and the devil has none, then technically you have none either. So Jesus still has all. But now it's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. And it's the Spirit of God in you that does the work. You know what Jesus said? He said, the works that I do, I don't do them. The Father in me, he does them. Isn't that right? So now the authority that Jesus has in us, it's his authority we wield. It's not our authority. It's not based on what I do, how good I am or how bad I am or anything else. My authority doesn't come or go based on how good I perform. My, the authority I walk in is not mine. It is Jesus's. Do you see that? The authority a policeman has is not his. It is the authority of that city. Now, if you don't believe that, <clears throat> I, well, I don't advise you to give this a try, but... You could look at the illustration that if a policeman, if you want to see the level of authority and the level of response, the level of power available to a policeman, all you have to do is watch when he makes one call, officer down, and you will see the full power of that community's police department descend on that point. They will all move there. Why? Because all he has to say is, officer needs backup. And bam, guess what he's got? Backup. I mean, they will come all over. They were right there. They will all, you know, <laughs> diverge on that point. Amen? Converge on that point. Why? Because they are coming to back him up. The full authority of that city will be at the, you know, disposal of that officer. Amen? Yep. See, when you start to understand, that's why Jesus said, man, I hadn't found this kind of faith in anybody. Why? Because nobody understood authority. Why? Because he was dealing with fishermen. He, he wasn't dealing with a, a soldier. But here he's got a soldier that understands authority. And he said, man, you got the greatest faith I've ever found. Think about that. So true authority 
is, and true faith is walking in authority. Now, <clears throat> understand this. Dominion, remember we were, I told you yesterday, last night, our mandate from God is to walk in dominion. Now, but that dominion pretty much was stolen at one point, and now in Christ we have that dominion back, right? But now notice this. Authority plus ability equals dominion. So you need authority and you need ability to equal dominion. If you have authority but no ability, you don't have dominion. If you have ability but no authority, you don't have dominion. But if you have authority and ability, you have dominion. Why? Because that is absolute dominion. In other words, you have the right to say so over that area. Amen? Now, <clears throat> as I was saying before, some people say, well, but, you know, I opened the door. I let the devil in. I gave him permission to do this. Okay, let's talk about that. Because you only, let's say here, okay, now I've got my keys on me, hanging right there for the car I drove here, right? <clears throat> now, but well, let's say I left these keys back there at the book table when I was back there talking. I just left them, didn't think anything about it, came in here, started teaching, and there were some people back there hanging out, and one person saw the keys and knew they were mine, and their friend came in and said, hey, how's it going? Oh, how are you doing? Hey, hey you know what? You want to you take a Tahoe for a drive? <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. What, what, well, here you go. Here. Take the, it's right out there and give them, uh, go out there and you know, hit the button until it lights up. You'll know which one it is, right? <laughs> and just take it for a drive. Okay, yeah, sounds great. And then so this person goes out, gets in the car, drives down the road. I finish teaching. I walk outside. My Tahoe's gone. What am I going to do? Oh, why did God do this to me? <laughs> no, that's not going to do. I'm going to jump on the phone and say, hey, police department, somebody stole my car. Isn't that right? Then they're going to come out, take the report. They're going to put out, you know, the... APB or whatever you want to call it nowadays, and they're going to tell somebody, look for this car, right? Look for this car. And now they're going to put that out, and they're going to take the report from me. Did you give anybody permission to drive your car? No, I did not. Okay, so we just pulled over your car. There was a guy in it, and we were talking to him. We'll find out what's going on. They walk up to the window, and they say, excuse me, is this your vehicle? No. Uh, okay, um, who, who told you? Well, my friend told me to, to take it for a drive. So, okay, well, is your friend's name Curry Blake? Uh, no. Well, this is Curry Blake's vehicle. Well, but my friend told me. Okay, but see, your friend didn't have the right to tell you you could do it. You see, it's still unauthorized. You understand? It's still unauthorized. Why? Because the owner didn't get permission. Do you see that? Somebody lied to that person and told them they had permission, and so they, they did it, but they're still guilty, and so is the person probably that stole the keys originally to tell them to do it. There'd be something, I'm sure. Right? So now think about this. You, only the owner of something can give permission for someone else to take it or get in it. Can we agree on that? Yes. Okay. Then I got a scripture for you. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. What price was that? The blood of Jesus. Jesus bought and owned you. So only Jesus could give the devil permission. That ain't happening. Why? Because he has all authority, and if he gave him permission, then he would be giving him authority, and at that point, Jesus would become a liar, and he would no longer have all, all authority. He would have given some of it away. He's not going to make himself a liar. He's going to keep all authority, and he's never going to give the devil permission or authority to work in your body. Do you get that? So I don't care who it is. I don't even care if they're not born again. At this point, technically, that doesn't even matter. Why? Because if you see someone that the enemy... Okay, another police example, okay? Actually, right here in Sulphur, Louisiana, several years ago. Well, many years, 1980, <laughs> many years ago. <clears throat> so I was walking from where we were living down to a 7-Eleven to get a Coke. That's where I was walking at, to get a two-liter bottle of Coke. I remember it like it was yesterday. I'm walking down the street. I go in, I get the Coke. I come back out. And I walk near, well, around the corner of the 7-Eleven, and there are two guys rolling around in the dirt fighting. I mean, they are getting after it, right? And there was four, I don't know, about three or four other people standing around just watching. And then pretty soon, all of a sudden, the police came up and, you know, jumps out and another car comes up and they get in there, they pull them apart and all that stuff. Now, the thing is, they did not walk up while they're fighting, choking each other, hitting each other. The policeman didn't walk up and say, excuse me, now, um, do you deserve this beating? <laughs> did, did you do? See, they don't even ask that. They, they stop the attack. 
They separate them. Then they find out who is at fault, and one of them probably goes to jail, right? But notice they didn't say, oh, oh, you, you said something to him, and you, so you started by saying, and then he hit you. Okay, so, oh, well, okay, I don't blame him a bit. Go ahead, finish it up, you know, <laughs> and walk off. That's not what happened. Why? Because they're not called to be that judge. You get? They're called to keep the peace. Two people rolling around on the ground beating each other is not peace. Right? So their job is to separate the two and then try to figure out what's going on and, you know, just decide who's going to jail. <laughs> right? So the whole point is this. With Christians, before we try to help somebody, we try to figure out if they deserve what they got. We try to go in and say, well, how'd you get this? How, how, when did it come? What'd you do? Oh, I see. You opened the door to it. Oh, I see here. See, and then we start giving permission to the devil that Jesus never gave. And then we stand back and we don't fight like we were supposed to fight for these people. We don't get in the middle of it and stop it. The key is to stop the suffering. Amen? Not to figure out why they're suffering. Who, who cares why? Right? Just stop it. And if you want to figure out why, do that after you stop it. Do that, uh, you know, later while you're discipling. It's like I have said before. I said what the church, what Jesus did. Jesus, and I'll start from this side. Jesus set people free, then discipled them. The church wants to disciple people into freedom. Do you see the difference? With, with most people, the church now, there's a long process before they actually get free. Strangely enough, that process usually involves money. Keep coming back for another session. Come back in. Oh, well, this will probably take 10 sessions, so that'll be $500. That's cheap, actually. I'm sure I've heard different things. I, I know of one case where a guy was charging people $5,000. And the thing was, here's the thing, see? <laughs> this is what's so amazing. This message works so well that this guy is a crook, but he heard the message. And he went around and started setting people free, but charging them. And charging them $5,000 just to get free. And still they weren't free, but they had given him thousands of dollars, and now we find out he'd been doing this a whole lot and even claiming the JGLM name and saying he was doing it and this had to, until I found out, you know, and then we're now we're trying to shut him down and find out who else he has, robbed, or, you know, robbed, basically. So there are people, but the funny thing is, according to our theology, when he started doing this, it shouldn't have worked for him. Why? Because his relationship with God wasn't right. But yet we think this only works if our relationship is right. No, it doesn't. It works because it's truth, and the truth will set you free, Right? So, see, I'm just trying to show you our ideas about God and how he does things haven't been right. God wants people free. He wants them free now, right? He doesn't want them free five years down the road. He wants them free now. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. Any day you keep dealing with a sickness or a problem like that that he's already paid for is a travesty of justice. It's already too long. Our job is to get all this stuff out of the way and just realize, you know what? This ain't right. If you're sick, it ain't right. If you're hurting, it ain't right. If you're mentally in fear and all, you know, anguish and all that kind of stuff, it ain't right. Let's just set you free. Now, but then you say, well, how do I stay free? Okay, we'll teach you how to stay free. But let's get you free first, and then we'll teach you how to stay free. Amen? Because the idea is that God wants you free. Jesus died to set everybody free. And yet we keep coming up with theology that keeps people in bondage rather than setting them free. And then we want, and the, the strange thing is, all we want to talk about is love. And yet we don't show it because we keep people in bondage. But we keep telling them, we love you. And God loves you so much, he's going to keep you in this bondage because it's working something better for you. It'll be good someday over there on the other side. You ever notice? I, don't, I, I understand, I'm not being sacrilegious or anything or blasphemous in this. I'm just saying... I don't need so much. I know it's going to be good over there. I don't need God so much in the sweet by and by. I need him in the ugly here and now. Yeah. Amen. This is when I need God. I don't need God when everything's perfect. I need him when everything's messed up. I don't need him to show up when I'm perfect. I can't wait that long. <laughs> right? I need him to show up when I'm all messed up. I need him to show up when I need a God. Not whenever everything's going good. Amen. Now, I'm not saying if everything's going good, you forget God. Of course not. But I'm saying we have this idea that everything has to be perfect before he will actually set us free. And that's not true. That's only humans. God, man, if you think about it, honestly, 
I don't care how good you've been. Your goodness compared to God's goodness is still light years apart. I mean, as far as just being good. So the key is to get these things out of the way and we set people free wherever we see them. Amen? Now, I want to finish up with this and we'll be done for tonight. Now, notice this. But do you see that Jesus didn't have to pick? He didn't have to go, okay, God, this one. God, this. See, people have this idea that Jesus went out every evening, sat under a tree, met with God, communed with God, and said, Father, I've got my day planner. What are we doing tomorrow? And then God would speak and say, well, now, son, tomorrow, now, as you're going through town, there's going to be a woman coming up behind you. She's going to have an issue of blood for 12 years, and she's going to come behind and grab the hem of your garment, and she's going to get healed. So walk slow. She's got to catch you. Right? We have this idea that that's how he lived. And then at some point, uh, now, son, now listen, you're going to be going, and you're going to, you're going to see this tree, and you're going to sit there. And at that point, there's going to be this Roman centurion. He's going to come up to you, and he's going to have a servant that's sick. And I want you to offer to go heal the servant, but he's going to refuse it. See, that's the way people think Jesus did. And Father, how will I know which centurion it is? There's a bunch of them. Well, this one's going to look like Ernest Borgnine. That's it. <laughs> right? If you remember Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, anyway, so. All right? But that's the way people think. People think that Jesus was like this machine, like a puppet, that God just moved around and as he walked through, somebody's there, and he just took his hand and threw it over on him because he's just a puppet. He's just being led, and they think that's being led. No, you were not to be led in this arbitrary fashion. We're to be led by the nature and character of God. We're to be led by love because love is the nature and character of God. And see, now we even have this perverted idea of what love is, and we tell them, uh, you know, because we have this human mindset that we somehow reason it out. Well, uh, God's letting you be sick because eventually it'll make you a better person. Sickness never makes people better. I mean, let's be honest. Sick people are usually really a pain to be around. It, isn't that right? I mean, think, I'm not being mean, but they become demanding. Okay, if the entire essence of Christianity is that we serve, people that are sick tend to have to be served not serve. So sickness can't be God's will if it makes you have to be served whenever his will is for you to serve. Yes. Just another reason to understand that sickness can't be God's will. Amen? Does that make sense? Yes. So all of these things together, and you realize, I mean, we've hit this thing a hundred different angles already. So we just have to start realizing, okay, yeah, there's something to this. Maybe God does want people just free. Maybe he's not looking... Well, especially, you know, telling, well, this will be better over there. This will be better sometime. This will make you a better person. This is going to, this will, you know, actually it says that these things, these uh, persecutions and different things that we go through, now not sickness, but these different persecutions stuff that we do go through uh, for the word's sake, that they work a far greater weight of glory in us. Why? Notice it doesn't just work. In other words, you go through something, that doesn't automatically make you better. It says, while we look not at the things which we see, but while we look at the things which we don't see. In other words, these problems only work for our benefit if we look at the Word and we are trusting God and we're looking at the Word and saying, okay, I understand this is a persecution for the Word's sake. Uh, this is a, you know, this sickness we're trying to get on I me. Mean, that's not from God. That's not working of greater weight. But so I'm going to look at what the word says. And the word says, by his stripes, I'm healed. So I'm going to believe that. And as long as I'm looking at this, then it's going to turn out better, even if the enemy attacks. But that attack, you notice what it says about Job? Because everybody brings Job up. Well, I guess I'm like Job. Uh, then be glad, because in about nine months from now, you're going to have twice as much as you started with, right? Because that's how Job ended up, right? But everybody's always like Job. And yet it's amazing because it says, after all this time, it says, and God turned Job's captivity. So if God turned his captivity, who was he in captive to? Not God. It was Satan. Do you, you get that? It's amazing how people say that. Well, I guess I'm like Paul. I just have Paul's thorn. Well, this, then you haven't read what Paul's thorn is because it's not sickness or disease. There's not one time Paul ever said he was sick. Not one time. He went through all of the things he suffered shipwreck, beaten with rods, fastings, prisons, all this stuff, right? Stone, left for dead, all this stuff. Not once did he mention, you know, sickness. Not once. And, if, and matter of fact, it said that this 
uh, you know, the spirit of infirmity, basically, that was on him was given because of his many uh, revelations. So if you're like Paul, let's hear some of your revelations, right? Paul had so many, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Is that right? And so he wrote all these things. And as a matter of fact, it said that that was given to him, that it would slow him down so that he wouldn't go out beyond measure to a greater degree is literally what it means. So this was given to slow him down. And it, wasn't, it was a messenger, an angel. The Greek word messenger, there is angelos or angel. And it said it was a messenger of Satan, not a messenger from God. So God didn't give Paul a thorn. And Paul was a Hebrew scholar. So he knew what a thorn in the flesh was. He said he talked about a thorn in the flesh. And so he knew Hebrew. And he knew that every time the word thorn in the flesh or pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides was used in the Old Testament, it always referred to people, never to sickness or disease. Not one time. Always had to do with people. Always. And he said, he even told them in the Old Testament <clears throat> four or five different times, he said, if you do not get all of these people out of this land, if you don't remove them, then they will come back to be thorns in your side and pricks in your eyes, thorns in your flesh, as we would say. And so he was referring to people. Well, <clears throat> what people was a thorn in Paul's side? The Judaizers. Why? Because they followed him around and caused him problems. And yet he said, I prayed three times that God would remove this. And, God's, and God didn't. Well, why not? If it was sickness, surely it would have been removed. But he said, but God told me, my grace is sufficient for you. Well, <clears throat> why didn't God remove it? Because the one thing that God promised, he said, even Paul wrote it, he said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution from people. Isn't that right? So obviously he couldn't remove that because God doesn't remove flesh from people. And he said, I prayed three times that God would remove this, and yet you do not find anybody praying for sickness any time in the New Testament. They never prayed for healing. Never. They commanded healing every time. Amen? So we could go on and on with this. But <clears throat> now, matter of fact, I think we're going to go ahead and quit here. Yep. And, yes, so that way we can pick up tomorrow and go right into um, the next session or section because I want to I want to keep this in one group when we start talking about this, because once you start to see, we're going to go through all of uh, Isaiah 53, <clears throat> and when we do, then we're going to talk about how, how to be led by the Spirit, how to know when you're led by the Spirit. We're going to bring in, we're going to talk about the anointing, what it is, what it isn't, all these different things. We're going to tie it all together tomorrow, and then tomorrow evening, also, we're going to be ministering to the sick. Amen? Amen. Now, so if you're in pain right now, if you've got things going on right now, Let's not do one more night with the, with the frogs as, as Pharaoh would do, right? Remember whenever Moses went to Pharaoh and said, are you finally done? You ready? And, and they got frogs everywhere. I mean, imagine that. Frogs all over the floor. Frogs bouncing around, doing these things in your bed, everywhere. And Pharaoh says, hmm, give me one more night to think about it. Really, you need another night to think about having frogs. No, right then should have been. So we just want to stop it right now. Amen. I don't want you to continue to be in pain or continue to have these things. Now, I have been <clears throat> all over the world, and we've seen, and the only reason I mention that is because of the things we've seen. We've seen God do the exact same thing on every continent because he's the same. And believe it or not, he loves everybody the same, so he treats everybody the same. So <clears throat> what we did in Peru was one of the first times I did this, one of them, yeah. <clears throat> in Peru, we had over 400 people healed, one command. I learned that from T.L. Osborne. Watched how he did it and started realizing because God, T.L. Osborne one time uh, was in front of a mass of people and he said, how can I do this? And God said, uh, can I heal five at one time? He said, well, yeah, you're God. Can I heal 50 at one time? He said, yeah, you're God. He said, how about 500? He said, well, come on, God, you're God. You can heal 500 at one time, of course. He said, how about 50,000? He said, oh, I get it. He said, I didn't have to lay hands on everybody. He said, I just gave one command. Thank you, Jesus. And when he did that, he said, yes. thousands of people were, were set free. Amen? Why? Because God is just that big. Amen? Amen? But see, the problem with most of us is we're Americans. And we want customer service. <laughs> and, you know, I drove six hours to get here, bless God. Cost me $100 for the hotel room. Uh, I've spent at least $250, $300 to get here. And bless God, I want a $300 prayer. Right? No, what you want is a prayer that works, right? 
And people say, well, I don't want some five-second prayer. Okay, well, let's take, let's, let me give you a 10-minute prayer and let you stay sick for 10 minutes as opposed to the five-second prayer I could have given you, and you could have got free in five seconds. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so, but we've gone all over, and I gave a command. 400 people got healed in Peru, in Lima, Peru, when we were there. And it was so funny. Uh, well, it wasn't funny. It was almost dangerous. Uh, but I had a person some people that were there with me and they were trying to videotape some stuff and they actually got up on a chair because the crowd, when I started to walk through the crowd, the crowd just swept through and they started getting knocked over and they actually ended up getting knocked over, hanging onto the camera and the people kind of moving them, almost like crowd surfing, you know, just taking them across and kind of getting them out of the way and they're trying to videotape at the same time of everything going on. And then we did the same thing in uh, Kiev, Ukraine. And I gave one command, we had about 3,000 people there, and I gave one command, and there was over two, what did they say? I'm trying to remember how many it was. I don't remember how many it was now. It was several hundred, I mean several hundred. They got healed, one command. We saw the telephone when I had everybody call the people. Hundreds of people got set free on that. Why? Because God is that big. He's just waiting for us to see him that big. Our problem is we still see him small. But the, more, the bigger you can see God, the more he can do. And if you still have to stop and think and ask and pray, then he can only do what you can ask and pray. But Ephesians 3.20 says he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. So let's give him some room to work. Amen? That's why expectation is the highest form of faith. And if you can start expecting him to do bigger things, he'll do bigger things. He's, he's not held back at all on his end. He's just held back by our little thinking. And usually that comes because we think we don't deserve it. Well, I don't think about me deserving it. I think about you deserving it. Now, don't you think about you deserving it? Or you, you know, because I'm thinking you do. So don't you think you don't. Amen? Amen? And just receive, okay? Now, if I knew you better, I might agree with you and say you don't. But I don't know you that well, okay? <laughs> so, but what I know is this. <clears throat> Jesus deserves what he died for. What he suffered for. Amen? All right, so let's just, how about we just give this prayer tonight. Tomorrow you come back here, we'll take some testimonies, see what all God did, and then we'll glorify him, and then we'll lay hands on people then if we need to, all right? I would expect everybody to get healed them all. Why can't he do that now? Amen? Amen. All right, Father, we thank you. So just receive. Just be ready to receive right now. Just receive from him. It's the easiest thing in the world, just like breathing, you know? It's just, you just receive from him, all right? I think you had a demonstration today of how to take what was given you, amen? So just, just take it, amen? He's offering it, just take it. So, Father, I thank you. Your word is true. Father, you're so good. And, we just, Father, we just want you to show off. And just, just you know, <laughs> just be you. And, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. These people, their, their healing has already been paid for. It's already done. It's already been purchased. Jesus has already suffered for it. And, Father, we're not asking him to suffer again. We're just saying thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your victory over your enemy of sickness and disease and these different things. So right now, in the name of Jesus, pain, you have no place here. You have no right here. In the name of Jesus, pain, right now, pain, fear, spirits of infirmity, spirits of weakness, even now, right now, you will leave these people. You have no place here. You have no right here. In the name of Jesus, you will leave them and you will leave them now. In Jesus' name, right now, and I don't mean maybe. They are owned by Jesus. You have no place right now. You will leave. Pain, go now in Jesus' name. I set them free by the name of Jesus, and because of those stripes, we set you free. So be it. Head to toe right now. So be it. Amen. Amen. Now just begin to do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't breathe, breathe. Couldn't move, move. Whatever it was you couldn't do before, just begin to do it. And watch. If you had pain, check for it. It's gone. Why? Because it can't stay. These things are easy to do. Now, and I'll tell you, now I didn't have anybody lay hands on me and show me how to do this. I learned this by reading about Smith Wigglesworth. <clears throat> That's where I got it. Amen. Wigglesworth. I, and and I've, I know um, Wigglesworth's granddaughters. Okay. Met them a couple of years ago in South Africa. They've actually asked me to preach at his church in Bradford. So I'll be preaching there in May or June, sometime like that, at uh, Wigglesworth Church there. And so he said uh, his son-in-law, James Salter, would sit on the front row. 
and Wigglesworth would stand up and he'd say, whoever stands up first gets healed of whatever they have. And James said, every time he would say that, he said, oh, he said, I would get so afraid that it wouldn't work and that we would lose the crowd. He said, I would just sink down in my chair. He said, because I didn't have Wigglesworth's faith. He said, but it never failed. He said, somebody would stand up and whatever they had, they'd get healed, whatever it was. And he said, it never failed. So I read that one day and I said, you know what? God loved Wigglesworth, but he loves me too. And mainly he loves the people. So if he would do that for Wigglesworth, he'll do that for Blake. Why not? It's not the name of Wigglesworth that matters. It's not the name of Blake that matters. It's the name of Jesus that matters. So he ought to get what he deserves. So I said, I'm going to do it. So I get up one time and I'm like, all right, here we go. Nobody knew it was my first time, right? Because I didn't get up and go, I'm going to try this for the first time. And we'll see if it works on you, right? And if it does, we'll perfect it later on other crowds. But right now, you're it. Now, you know. So I just got up and I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I said, how many of you have pain? And they raised their hands. I said, all right, in the name of Jesus right now, pain, I forbid you to remain. You will go and you will go now. And I said, all right, now, who got healed? Let me see your hand. And it was the funniest thing. I mean, nobody moved. And I'm there. I said, okay, come on. Who got, who got healed? Who? Pain's gone. Somebody's out there. I know somebody. And it, and it seemed like forever, right? And I started, I could feel sweat. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking, mm, okay, Lord, do something quick, quick, quick. And about the time I saw one hand, I mean, as soon as I saw him, I'm like, I see that hand. There it is. There's a hand right there. There's a hand. We have a hand right there. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Right? And then about the time, I was, oh, glory, another hand right there. Oh, there's another. And it was like popcorn. It just got faster and faster and faster and faster. And pretty soon, everybody there that had pain got healed. And I'm like, glory to God. And I left there, and I'm like, when I left there that night, I'm like, God, you are so amazing. It is so amazing that you just did it. And then I told him, who touched you? Wasn't Curry Blake. It's Jesus, right where you are. Amen? That's what Christianity is, your connection to him. Not through me, to him. Amen? So, just be free. And watch. And tomorrow we'll take testimonies and we'll take some time. Amen? Amen. You guys? There we go. Bless you guys.